I be sure in a world that's constantly changing? Well, those were the words of a song made popular by the Rascals back in 1967. Although it was primarily a love song, it echoed the philosophy of that time, which has continued ever since, which is that we cannot be certain about anything. The professor of uh, one of my English classes when I was working on a master's in 1989 challenged the class by saying, is there anyone here who thinks he knows anything? He was so sure that constant change meant that nothing could remain true for very long that he virtually dared anyone to raise his hand and say, I know something. You probably know who answered. To his way of thinking, anyone who claimed to know something was arrogant. To my way of thinking, anyone who denies that a person can know anything is arrogant. Just because he didn't know anything doesn't mean that the rest of the people present did not know anything. And anyway, why should somebody who by his own admission doesn't know anything be teaching a class? I would rather learn literature from somebody who actually knew something and was confident about what he knew. Of course, the world, especially in our age, changes on a daily basis, sometimes due to discoveries, research, inventions, but not all truths are replaced. Not everything changes. Addition and subtraction still seem to work as well as they always have. Just because we learn some new information does not mean that everything we know is wrong or subject to change. But spiritually, <clears throat> we know even more than we do in the physical world because God has revealed reality to us in his world. word. We see what is physical, but spiritual truths we can only arrive by from the revelation that God has given us. We would know little, for example, about sin apart from God's holy book. Sure, we would know that people do wrong things, even malicious things. But would we deduce, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Romans 3.23, we might. How about knowing more than that, however? You know, most people don't like to think of themselves as sinners. Most people do not think they're bad people, no matter what they do. But how many people, apart from God's revelation, would comprehend that the wages of sin is death? Romans 6, 23. Neither would we know that Jesus came and paid the price for our sins, the price uh, that we owed that we could not pay because we read God uh, that Jesus gave himself for us while we were yet sinners, Romans 5 and verse 8. The scriptures communicate to us both certainty and truth. How many of the following statements that Jesus made sound like he was confused? or unsure of himself. Here's a sampling. John 8, 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Or John 8, 46, which of you convinces me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Or John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. Or John 12, 48, he who rejects me and receives not my word has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Or John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus knew who he was. He knew what sin was. 
He knew what man needed, and there is not even a, a hint of uncertainty in the things that he says. Now, one can imagine most college professors and probably a few theologians objecting to anyone exhibiting that much confidence. Who does he think he is? Well, as we said, Jesus knew who he was. But there are some other things that we can know. So let's take a look at a couple of those. First of all, we can know that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He foretold that he would rise from the dead, and he is the only one who can say, as he does in Revelation 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. He was seen by more than 500 followers at one time after he arose from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. Only his resurrection can explain why the disciples preached the gospel with such conviction. They knew Jesus was not dead. They witnessed him alive after he had been put to death. They spoke with him. They ate with him. They saw him ascend into heaven. And they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts. They were able to do miracles. People believed because of all this evidence. So there are things we can know, things that are totally attested to and that there is more than sufficient evidence for but second we can know that we have salvation what would be the point of Jesus dying for the sins of mankind thus making salvation available to everyone if we could not know then that we were saved now in the day before GPS systems, which sometimes work, travelers would use a map to see where they were while they were en route to their destination. The motorist would then know, well, how far is it to the next town? Well, according to the map, it's this. Do we need to change routes? Are we supposed to get on another route? Well, it would tell you that, and so on. The scriptures serve as our roadmap. If someone on a journey put down the map and said, I feel we've arrived at our destination and stopped the car, his fellow travelers might want to point out that according to the map, they were still three hours away from the city of their destination and they were sitting in a farm field in Pennsylvania, and that wasn't where they were going. Despite his feelings, it doesn't matter if he feels he's arrived, what does the evidence say? Yet people ignore what the Bible says about salvation, and they say, well, I feel I'm saved. Someone might protest, you know, boom, but salvation is such a personal thing you can't tell someone their feelings are wrong no but God's roadmap can God's roadmap informs them when they have not arrived at their destination what do we mean by feelings well some people will say something like this well I prayed about it and I just feel that I'm saved or some people may say something like this. I had a warm feeling come over me. Uh, and that's all I need to prove it. Or I just had a moment of realization and clarity that I just knew God had accepted me. Well, these would all be very fine if that's the way God said that it worked. But he doesn't. Instead, he said, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but who so walks wisely shall be delivered, Proverbs 28 and verse 26. 
Walking wisely means checking with God's road map. A map that by, uh, bypasses the city of faith is not going to take anyone to heaven. Faith in God and in Christ is absolutely essential. Then there's the city of repentance that cannot be ignored. Luke 13, 3. Jesus said clearly, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You can't get to heaven without driving through the city of repentance. No one, by the way, should mistake sorrow for repentance. That leads to salvation. Godly sorrow leads to repentance, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. But repentance is, as defined in the last hour, turning away from sin. Now, how many people feel that they have been saved without repentance? A significant number of humanly devised sinners' prayers never mention repentance. How many people have maybe read a tract like this and given themselves to Jesus, quote unquote, and they have never followed his instruction to repent because it was never mentioned. But if nearly half of the sinner's prayers made up by men not found in the scriptures, if nearly half of them do not mention repentance, then consider this, that 100% of them ignore baptism. Most deny that baptism is a requirement. But which of the following things did Jesus actually say? Did he say in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved? Or did he say he who believes and is not baptized shall be saved? Now, you know which one many people are living by, but Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. So how can a person know that he is saved? Not with feelings about it. Certainty comes from having followed the map. We travel through the metropolis of faith, pause for some serious reflection, in the town of repentance, and find salvation at baptism. In that city, the blood of Jesus washes away our sins. The basis of our salvation, then, is not how I feel about it, although people feel pretty uh, joyous when they actually do what God says. But knowing that we have followed God's objective word. Let's take a look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> In verse 3 we read, Now by this... Now, we've been talking about how do we know God? How do we know Jesus arose from the dead? How do we know uh, that we have salvation? By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. So how can a person know that he is saved? Does he believe in God? Does he have faith? Has he repented of his sins? Has he confessed Christ to be the Son of God? Has he been baptized? Well, those are the things that God commanded regarding salvation. And so if you have done those, then you know that you are saved. You know that you know God. But if you have not done those, you cannot have that knowledge. Now, having provided certainty concerning our sins being washed away, we can also be sure 
that we have salvation and remain saved every step of the way the rest of our lives. How can we do that? Is it because of the Calvinistic doctrine, once saved, always saved? No. There are two ways that we know that that teaching is false. One is because the scriptures explicitly say so. For example, in Galatians 5, 4, Paul is writing to Christians and he says, if you attempt to be justify yourselves by the law, meaning the law of Moses, you have fallen from grace. That explicitly says it. Connor brought up another uh, verse this morning from uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 10. That those who had been justified could still be lost. And there are many other passages that deal with that subject. So explicitly, the Bible teaches against once saved, always saved. It also teaches against it implicitly. For example, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, brethren, uh, uh, we need to take warning lest we drift away. Well, why have a warning if there's not a penalty? And the penalty is described in verses 2 and 3 of Hebrews 2. So there's explicit and implicit, and there are plenty of warnings of both in the New Testament uh, against that doctrine. So that's not how we can know we're saved every step of the way. Cre uh, clearly, the Christian can lose his salvation. But there are guarantees of salvation. However, this demands a response from us. It's not something automatically granted in which we play no part or no role. The first ground of certainty is to walk in the light. The passage just preceding 1 John 2, 3, and 4, 1 John 1, 7 through 10, talks about walking in the light. Does our commitment to the light mean that we don't sin? No. Twice the passage says if we say that we have no sin, we uh, deceive ourselves. But walking in the light means that we do not practice sin. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> 1 John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil. Now you can't tell because Greek verbs do not always uh, come over into the English clearly. But the idea is the one who practices sin. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For the purpose, the son of, uh, this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Now wait, John, you already said we did. But he's talking about practicing sin habitually. Uh, his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now I hope it's not that difficult to tell the difference between falling short and sinning, perhaps due out of human weakness or uh, being caught unawares, as opposed to determining to practice something that is sinful. For example, a person might foolishly give in to sexual temptation, which then brings on a guilty conscience, great regret, and repentance of that behavior, determining never ever to give in to that sin again. Now how vastly different is that than to decide to live with someone outside of marriage or to live with someone you're not entitled to marry. One situation involves living imperfectly and making a correction. The other is a rejection of righteousness. We surely can see the difference between those two. Walking in the light involves evaluating our behavior and making the appropriate corrections. Now, 
we confess those things to God and determine to do better. This is all that human beings can do. For that reason, we need the blood of Christ to continually cleanse us from all sin. It is disappointing, and I'm sure all of us disappoint ourselves in falling short. But at least we repent and confess and are cleansed, and that is what makes us acceptable to God. Now, a word about keeping commandments. Hmm. Is being a commandment keeper trying to earn our way to heaven? Oh, that's what some people charge, isn't it? No. How do we know that we know him? Well, as we've already said, by what? Keeping his commandments. We didn't invent this answer. An inspired apostle wrote these words. And somebody charges, well, well that makes you a legalist. And people are going to object to that. Well, uh, we're not legalists. We're doing what God says. And the person who makes that charge is questioning God and his plan for redemption. Again, he's the one that wrote these things. We didn't make this up. So what does, you might wonder, an illegalist look like? Well, this is a person who violates God's laws at will confident that God will forgive because of his great grace. But his great grace does not cover open rebellion, or else the angels would not have fallen and been cast out of heaven. God's grace does not cover rebellion and hard-heartedness, but it's attuned to repentance when God gave the Ten Commandments to Israel, they were expected to keep them, weren't they? Did God, you know, if, if somebody keeps the Ten Commandments, did the other Israelites go around and say, oh, you're a commandment keeper? No, they were all expected to keep the commandments. There was a man who gathered sticks on the Sabbath day who found out the answer to this the hard way. The congregation was commanded after they sought what God wanted them to do, the congregation was uh, commanded to stone him with stones outside the camp, Numbers 15, 32 through 36. Now this can't be verified, but it's been alleged that his final words were, you hypocritical legalists. No, they were just keeping God's commandment. Apparently, there was a punishment for using uh, the name of the Lord in vain also. An Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 11. He was likewise stoned. Had he been one of today's liberals, he probably would have said, I didn't blaspheme, I was just misunderstood. But uh, they thought they understood him well enough to put him to death. God expects us to obey all of God's commandments. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The saved person does the will of the Father. Doing a portion of his will will not suffice. Jesus defines doing a portion of his will as lawlessness. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You can't refuse to even not keep 5% of God's law. He didn't just make it that way. What he wanted done, he commanded to be done. Now, 2 Peter chapter 1, 5 through 11 describes one of, was well, one passage that describes Christian security. Uh, let's turn over there and read that uh, passage. But for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. That's courage. Examples of that would, would be like uh, uh, Daniel continuing to pray when the king's edict forbade it, or as his friends refusing to fall down and worship the uh, idol. Uh, that's courage, that's virtue. 
uh, and to your virtue, knowledge, and to your knowledge, self-control. That's a hard one. It's a lot easier to be impatient and sometimes a lot more embarrassing, too. Perseverance. Brethren in the first century sure needed that one because their lives were at stake frequently. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. Now, you might say, well, you know, everybody knows those. That goes without saying. Well, if it goes without saying, why does God mention them? Maybe we need to rethink those a little bit. But let's uh, finish the passage. Those are qualities that we need. How badly do we need those qualities? For if these things are in you and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness. Now, if you've ever had your eyesight threatened, you know the fear of what it means to be blind. And yet some people are spiritually blind and have no fear. How ironic. And has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things... If you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be uh, supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We don't need to be unsure about salvation. God has provided us a way to be sure, walking in the light keeping God's commandments, having this kind of character and working to develop it. These are ways we can be sure. No one wants to live in uncertainty. Therefore, God tells us in clear language what it takes to be saved in the first place. Faith, repentance, confession, baptism. Likewise, he desires that we continue to know what is required after we are baptized so that we can know we are saved all along on the road to heaven. No child of God should have to awake on judgment day surprised to be lost. All that we need, to, uh, need is uh, found in the teachings of the New Testament. Those things can make us sure. Those things can make us certain. May we all love and exhort and encourage one another to remain faithful and to evaluate ourselves regularly in light of passages such as 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. We must not let anyone talk us out of loving obedience. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation, Hebrews 5, 9, to all them that obey him. We're going to have a song and a prayer to